Let's go. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Benchtown TV's coverage of The Wheel of Time. So I assume you read the podcast title before clicking on this episode, but in case you didn't, this is us deep diving episode four, The Dragon Reborn. So a lot of important shit goes down in this episode and kind of to help us organize our thoughts about it. We're going to tackle each storyline on its own. We'll start by showing the opening scene a little love because I'm a personal fan of it. I think it was just it was just great. We'll get to it. Uh, We'll move then to Perrin and Egwene's travels with the Tinkers. We'll move then to Rand, Matt and Tom's flight from Breen Spring. And finally, we'll end with Nynaeve, Loghain and the Aes Sedai. So yeah, this opening scene, they didn't, this is actually the first time we've really seen men channeling and how they're going to visualize how the corruption of the power looks. And this is our first real introduction to Loghain. So at the end of episode three, we meet him and we just see him in the cage. So I thought this was a great way to kind of go from the end of episode three to the start of episode four. Let's hear some thoughts. I'm glad they just dove right into the Loghain backstory, like, well, the brief backstory of where he was prior to being captured, but that was exactly, I was hoping it wouldn't be anything else. I was just really, this guy captured all of our attentions at the end of episode three. So I'm glad they addressed it just immediately at the start of this episode. And what an episode for the guy. My God, I, I, if you didn't hear in the instant reaction, this was my favorite episode by far of wheel of time. And one of my favorite pieces of television, including Luke's uh, we've seen in recent memory so excited to deep dive this episode and the intro to Logan was just incredible it was not i mean it was a huge power disparity from what we've seen before this dude's just walking around flinging like black dark weaves threads everywhere mm-hmm. um it just looked phenomenal like you guys said and you know such a cool backstory for a character that we literally just met and it just set the the tone for the entire episode for you know the Aes Sedai storyline just literally on edge because they have like a ticking bomb literally in captivity yeah so I'm pretty passionate about this episode so with that being said I apologize if I'm going to be repeating some things from the instant reaction but this episode was fucking amazing Loghain he blew my expectations out of the water and he he was just so fun every time he was on screen such a scene stealer even when he was talking with like people like Moraine like I was still just so interested in everything he has to say because they're just painting him as this this messiah character and almost exactly like that even as the hair he the look of Jesus Christ right like he's coming he thinks that he is the dragon reborn he thinks he is the savior he's going to unite the world and all that and just the way that they make him talk and fight the madness and have the corrupted weave is just perfection and I don't think I could have thought of a better idea for how they were going to do it and hopefully people from the books aren't too mad because this is all extra scenes that's that's the opening scene is done off page so hopefully this satisfied everybody because I don't think you can really complain about how good it was and just showing his madness the level he was at and how strong he was yeah I one of the biggest questions I had going into this series as a whole was how they would do this this madness that a lot of these books takes place in people's heads. It's a lot of introspective thought. It's kind of people going back and forth with this madness in their head. And when they rolled out the voice at first, I was like, okay, this is cool. And then the woman kind of comes into his ear and I was like, oh, and then the guy comes from the other side and I was like, oh, so I just thought it was fucking awesome. And this is also a great characterization of Loghain himself. I mean, like they've said, they give us that little teaser, that little tidbit at the end of episode three and then now they just throw us into the deep end episode four we're supposed to think that he's kind of this bad evil guy but they did a great job of showing us that Loghain is not like that he truly Mm -hmm. believes that he is the dragon reborn he wants to do good he wants to bind the world together he doesn't want to break it and I think they did a good job of showing from his perspective especially that everyone is so afraid of him but they really don't need to be this is him thinking this so I just, yeah, that, that duality to it, I thought was expressed really well. Yeah, because if he thought he was the actual Dragon Reborn, which he does, and he does want to save the world, this is how you would go about it. He's fighting back the evil urges he's getting from these voices who he thinks are past dragons, and that's fine because he's just taking it as, do I use their advice versus not? And that's super powerful because that was a big twist. I totally thought he was just going to cut the King of Gildean's head off, like right at the end of this opening credit scene. But I do want to quickly talk about something, though, just... This will tie right back into the opening scene about 
the physical weaves that they show on screen. So if you don't know that there, there's a book consultant that worked really close on the show with Rafe Judkins, and she's a great social media follow. If you guys haven't heard of her, her name, Kyle, correct me if I'm wrong. Is it just Serhan Nakamura? Yeah, I can get the name for you, but. Okay, Sarah N. Nakamura is what her Twitter name is. She's like an absolute subject matter expert when it comes to the books, and she was used constantly to critique and make sure the writing and, and the decisions that they put onto screen made sense in the long term. Um, so one of the things she clarified after this episode, because there was a lot of confusion with book readers and new show watchers about who can see the physical weaves that we're seeing as audience members. And what she goes on to say is it's going to, for the women, at least it's going to match exactly how it is in the books where only the, the white wisps that you're seeing, which we're calling weaves can only be seen by other women with the power. So that's important to know the things that are physically manifest through the power can be seen by everybody like Moraine's fireballs, like that's physically manifest and happening, but the weaves and the magic source being pulled into her that can only see the white weaves that are pulled into her can only be seen by other women eyes to die and now on the flip side what we get introduced with Loghain is he has the black corrupted magic which is pulling from the male power and only other men can see this so the confusion comes in in the end in the very end scene when Nynaeve has this explosion of power and you see the weaves people were saying that Loghain shouldn't have been able to see the power and then what Sarah argued on Twitter is that he doesn't he's just reacting to the physical presence of the power in the room he can't actually see all those weaves around her only the women i said i would have been able to see that just want to clarify on that that nobody except for male power users are going to be able to see this black corrupted power that Loghain's using yeah so when the king of gaelden is stopped from trying to stab Loghain in the neck essentially with his dagger he doesn't see what's grabbing him and forcing him to his knees he just feels it happening and he doesn't see the faces talking yeah. to Loghain behind him and neither would Moraine if she was there yeah it definitely makes it honestly more intimidating that this man is just kind of being controlled by air almost from his perspective and a nice little tidbit is that in the dagger he has it has like on the on the guard I believe it is has the little red circle with the three white dots. And that is the book canon flag of the, the kingdom of Gaelden. So he doesn't have a name. He is, I believe, to be a made up character. But that flag and stuff was book accurate. Man, dude, when he's walking around and just flicking his finger and it's doing crazy shit, it just shows you how powerful he is. And it was just so epic. Love when he catches the two arrows mm -hmm. getting shot at him. So moving on to our first storyline we're going to talk about would be Perrin and Egwene. This storyline shows us a lot of the emotional side of Perrin at this point. It gives Perrin essentially a good outlet to kind of talk about his feelings, which I'm a personal sucker for because Perrin is my favorite character. We do get a little bit of Egwene and Aram, who is the, the young tinker. So we can talk about that first, and then we can move more into Perrin's kind of deeper philosophical, not questions, but kind of discussions that he has with uh, Ela. This was kind of the snooze fest of the episode. Not saying it was bad because I did enjoy how it kind of built up the tinkers and what their outlook on life is like the way of the leaf, like we said on the instant reaction. I mean, just a really cool way of looking at life and a way to live your life, but everything going on with Egwene and Aram to me, that was just solidifying that Egwene knows that Rand is out there and is looking for her. She knows that he's not dead yet. And Perrin is just like, he needs some guidance, man. He he looks like a lost puppy just walking around in the middle of nowhere. He, Everyone keeps rubbing it in. Yeah. Like, they don't know that they're rubbing it in, but they're rubbing it in. Yeah, like when she was saying you ever pick up a weapon before and goes through them all and says axe, and then just sees him like freeze, and then she keeps talking about the axe. It's like, yeah, come on, man. Don't she that up. she somehow knows. She just looked at Perrin and was like, I know exactly what happened to this guy. She also sees someone that's kind of on the edge, someone that could eventually turn the, of the way of the leaf. It's the eyes of battle that I feel like she's just, she knows she's been around yeah. the block. He is almost trying to convince himself during their conversations that the way of the leaf is so ridiculous. Like, how could there never be violence and all this stuff? And she knows in her heart that he has been through something that he won't say and right. that she, this is someone that she could convert. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ela's speech to Perrin later on the episode is beautiful. Like, it's so good, so well written, and just explains her perspective. I don't know if that's accurate or not to the books, but that's just a really cool way 
to explain that the whole tinker mindset that they're doing this for the wheel they're doing this for the the future generations that are to come to make the world a better place it seems like in this conversation to me in the eyes of the tinkers the wheel is almost like reincarnation because she's talking about how she uh she like lost her daughter was it her mm-hmm. daughter was killed aram's mother yeah aram's mother was killed and that she's not like ha- like happy about it but you know she's more so she sees the eyes from her perspective she's like she will be returned to me eventually in some way the wheel will make it happen like she will be quote unquote reincarnated into a new person and that's why i am currently working on making the world a better place because yep. when she comes back i want it to be a good world for her well he started that out. i was, it was struggling happy it was, that her daughter died <laughs> it was a struggle to get there but no i just wanted to emphasize that it just you can see the the iterations of real world culture come into here because it seems to me like re- reincarnation to a degree oh yeah yeah and I did like that. Heron was like, yeah, you know, you're not going to see it. Your grandchildren's grandchildren are most likely not going to see this time of peace. But she was like, ah, I know. But, you know, mm-hmm. it's for my whenever my daughter gets churned Come out and the, the wheel turns her out again. Yeah. And I was like, all right, that's cool that, you know, like the long term goal. It's is- a nice outlook to have in this dreary world of wheel of time that we have. <laughs> I, I do also just really like the fact that she even acknowledges that after it happened she was about to go find the people that did it and hunt them down and she was looking for revenge and parent even says revenge doesn't sound like the way of the leaf i just love her response to that which just is what greater revenge against violence than peace what greater revenge against death than life that i think is almost the perfect summation a little bit of the way of the leaf and the way the tinkers think nah kill him get all the leaves and make him choke on it I hear uh, way of the leaf, and I just think of Naruto. <laughs> Alki was singing the song. <laughs> yeah. We did get the confirmation that they are heading east to Tower Valon. I say Tar Valon. Why? What is it? Because the audiobooks say Tar Yeah, it's been Tar Valon in my head yeah. for years at this point. But now that the Tar-Valon. show is, is focusing on Tar Valon, I'm trying to do Tar Valon. Okay. So cool. Yeah. So we do get the confirmation that. They're heading east and that they're lucky they even stumbled upon Gwen and Perrin because originally they would have taken a route out, but they're soldiers down south. So they're like, so all roads are fucking heading east. Yeah. So, the wheel weaves as the wheel wills. Huh? Hell, hell yeah. In my opinion, like the, my favorite piece of information we get from the Tinkers is talking about the song again because they bring it up and Aram clears that up of what the whole idea about the song is, is that before the breaking of the world and before the last dragon, there was the Tinker faction had a song that was supposed to bring harmony to the world and that was lost after the breaking of the world and that's what their whole purpose is that's why when they first see Gwen and Perrin they're like do you know the song they ask that to every single person that's ever that they ever come across until they finally find the song and bring peace to the world and to me I have no idea where that's going to go but that seems like some end game shit I don't know like how important that song is going to be but that seems like a book 14 season 8 kind of payoff and if it is like that, and it does turn out to be that important. That's awesome that we're getting a glimpse at it this early, especially because a tinker himself, Aram, doesn't even believe in it. So it's like there's there's not even this full faith that it's going to save the world or anything like that. So if it becomes important, that's going to be a really cool moment to look back on. What if the song is Every Time We Touch? I oh that gosh. is the song. They're that, waiting for us to be born into yeah, this world. That brings harmony to the world. That's in the scene where uh, they're at the celebration. The Tinkerers are throwing a party. I was really waiting for Aram to take an axe into the chest right there. Just like getting <laughs> flashbacks to yeah, episode one. I was just like, all right, where's the uh, where are the Trollocs coming into play in this one? But thankfully, everything turned out OK, but definitely was waiting for that violent. But we get it in the following scene, which we'll get into later. But the next scene is that Trolloc scene. Yeah. And the last thing I'll say about it, too, is Aram has a really interesting line that I looked And I don't think this is book accurate, which doesn't matter because I really think it's an interesting addition to the Tinkers and their belief system that at 20, they're allowed to actually leave the caravan and the wagons Mm -hmm. to go experience the world. And Aram even says, you know, some people go fishing, some people farm, some even pick up arms. The fact that the Tinkers kind of allow people to go do that and experience the world and then decide, I just think is a nice little wrinkle to them. And he even says that a lot of people do come back, but that'll just be interesting maybe going forward of that if we will meet tinkers kind of on this yes, journey, I was just thinking that. Yeah. That'd just cool. out in the world. I think that would be fun. And I'm honestly expecting that to happen. I feel like I'm expecting it to happen specifically to parent too. Yeah. I feel like he would be of anyone so far would be the one to find a tinkerer out in the world to get another perspective of the tinkerer lifestyle, but just push life- him towards it. Maybe yeah. 
That sounds very Wheel of Time. <laughs> and I can imagine. Okay, this will be the last comment I'll make on the storyline. It's Tink Ers. Yeah, Tink One Er. Yeah, not Ers. Yeah, we're not doubling up on the Ers. But the last thing about this storyline is basically <laughs> that Aram. We definitely get a glimpse in his crushing on Egwene. Yeah. Like we he can likes see, her. Yeah, he likes her. So I don't. I just wanted to put that into the world, just because we don't know if that'll be revisited. Like you know, if Rand and her don't work out, then she's got this backup in Aram. Who is a very handsome and charismatic? He's a handsome guy. guy. His eyes. He's got those like deep. I've never seen like bright brown eyes. You know, like they're very nice to look at. Speaking of Rand, we can move on to our second storyline, which is Rand, Matt, and the legend Tom Marilyn. So in this storyline, we get kind of three really important things happen. So the first one is Tom's backstory, and I fucking love this part. I was waiting for this to happen. I'm excited that they kind of throw it in in episode four i mean this is fucking awesome so we learned about tom tom's nephew owen and his story and kind of a little bit of backstory with tom's relationship with men channeling and the eyes to die did this kind of come out of left field for you guys i don't think that there's any way you could have expected tom would have had this kind of shit sitting in his locker not directly this close to him i felt like you know he's a wise old man i feel like he's been around the block and seen some things but i didn't expect it to happen to you know his own nephew per se and that maybe that this will contribute to some sort of vengeance against the Aes Sedai that we haven't seen before and who knows we'll we could get into that and that'd be really cool but i just thought it was really awesome getting one of my favorite characters so far as backstory i thought he was pretty uh wise in the the one power area just because of coming he had after he killed dana the bartender he was saying like did you hear what she said she said she's a dark friend like body and soul like sworn to the dark one so Mm -hmm. the way he kind of talked about it like that it kind of made me think that he knew what he was talking about a little bit but it was cool to hear the explanation of how men start to go mad after you know using it for a little while and then if they do get gentled then they just hate life it's like like the worst uh, relapse or not relapse. It's the worst uh, withdrawal withdrawal ever. Mm-hmm. Theory going out here right now. Tom Marilyn used to be a warder, and that maybe his Aes Sedai counterpart died. Kind of like Stepin. We see eventually. Spoiler alert! But Stepin doesn't. Die. Does yeah, die. but he doesn't die. But in the sense that he loses someone, and gotcha. he probably just like gives up that lifestyle, and now he just wanders, like trying to find maybe some kind of other purpose, or specifically look for the DR. So okay. that's just a little theory. I just, as Paul was talking, I was like, hmm, you know, he does know a lot about this kind of stuff. And it'd be cool if he was involved in it at some point. And maybe that's kind of also tied to how his nephew got killed. Like maybe he has some kind of guilt over himself for, you know, being a part of that and that his nephew somehow got involved. So I think that'd be cool. Yeah. I'm really curious to see how his first interaction with an, like if he gets an interaction with an Aes Sedai on screen, how that would like play out. Cause mm. I wonder if he has the same mindset in the show as like Nynaeve does. Mm. Well, how Nynaeve kind of hates all of them, but who knows? But a couple things I want to point out that we get in the beginning of this whole storyline that I love is thankfully we're starting to call the eyeless fades a little bit more. That's and I'm I'm way more into us using that term. Yeah, it just sounds cooler. Fade it sounds so awesome. And like that's what uh I think Matt says that when he's re reemphasizing what Dana said yeah. after them. So fades. I'm gonna keep saying fade for now. I'm done with eyeless. Is that an it's an official proclamation? For myself, I'm done saying eyeless. That's fine. Yeah. Fade is so much cooler. All right, we're a fade podcast. Yeah, I like yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Another thing I wanted to point out is I loved the little detail that they gave Rand again, showing his expertise. I would say in in using a bow. Yeah. When he calls out the villager, who he's like, "You would only you would use your fingers if you really wanted to kill us." That was really cool because Rand just gets another like you know charisma moment, and I thought that was cool to see because we already know that he's good with the bow from episode one, I think. And then. The third thing is, as we were talking about this Owen thing, what Tom leads into that conversation with is saying that Matt's starting to show all the signs of power madness, right? He's getting sick and he's like being weird and sketchy. So it's good to know that Tom, there's characters that are starting to guess like who has powers, right? Like, so Tom thinks that Matt's starting to get corrupted. That's a great point. Well, I didn't think about that, that there's characters that are joining us Mm and trying to guess. guess. Yeah, Yeah. who is that's I like that. That's meta as fuck i know right a <laughs> uh, one little comment too to jump off of the the scene where they meet up with the villager not even meet up i guess they get caught by the villager and matt's hand goes into his cloak behind his back so even then matt is reaching for that dagger 
another little hint that Matt is kind of slowly developing this level of paranoia and kind of not violence either. It's just there's something going on with him. He's getting weak. He's a little becoming weaker. Meanwhile, Rand, the honest Abe over here, just <laughs> could, can't tell a lie. That it's giving you like main character, like hero vibes. Yeah. Just so honest. Didn't want to kill the farmer or his family or anything like that or any harm. He was just like, "Hey, we uh, we were just going to crash. We're going to leave. No big deal." Yeah. It did work though. Yeah, I yeah. love it. And a nice little tidbit too here is the farmer mentions that the countryside is full of soldiers who abandoned that rebellion in the south, which I believe is a reference to Loghain's and Loghain's army. Mm-hmm. So they're kind of just connecting events that are happening in the world because we got the same thing with Aram and the Tinkers and Egwene and Perrin. So I just like that they're doing this. And then to take us back to Tom's story about Owen at the end of it, when he said the way he says it, I like a little bit when he's saying that the Reds cut Owen off from the power before he like tried to kill himself. Uh, so we're you know, the, now that we have exposure to the Ajas, the different colors, knowing that even random people outside of the White Tower know that certain colors have different affinities like in the world, like the Reds. That's just such like a negative connotation, I feel like for most people. And it's also important to know that once Owen was stilled or gentled, they let him go back and live a normal life. So they truly only care about the ability to touch the power, don't care about like their intentions or what they'll go on to do after. They just want to cleanse the world of the power and then move on. And then that whole story ends with Tom actually being pretty genuine. He's like, dude, I want to I'll protect you guys. Stick with me. We're going to keep Matt away from the Reds. Yeah. Which is a really cool line. He's going to protect Rand, too. Yeah. Mm hmm. And while we're at it, we might as well end that conversation with what Rand says to Tom saying for a glee man, you know, you're pretty scary or whatever. And he's like, you know, that's the purpose. The glee man is just a cover up to what we actually are. And we're just these knowledgeable people that you should definitely be afraid of. But the glee man covers that up. So that line, you know, it's something basically about that. A glee man is a happy name, but a man who knows the past is very dangerous. A silly name that makes them less afraid. Really cool. I love Tom. Uh, Yeah, it was really cool, especially when he said, you know, the last Dragon Reborn uh, corrupted the one power so men couldn't use it without. Yes, that was very interesting. So I thought like that was just always how it was. Men would always go mad. I didn't know that the old DR corrupted it. So that begs the question. Can you? He says the dark one. Dark one. Oh, the dark one. I'm sorry. For some reason, I was thinking uh, the yeah, old I, DR. I think I had the old DR, too, in my notes. But, um, it was the DO. The, D- <laughs> the DO. So that begs the question, you know, can he cleanse the one power and, and make it so everybody can use it? I'm glad you brought this up because I was actually having that theory go on in my head while we were watching the second time with Loghain. So when Loghain is talking about his objective, he specifically says he wants to bind the world and not save it and obviously not, not break, break it. it yeah he doesn't want to break it but he specifically uses the word bind meaning to me when we heard that quote of tom saying that the dark one corrupted the one power broke the one power that maybe Logan's intentions wasn't also just to save the world but also to fix the one power so that it could be used by men as well so that's kind of where my mind was with Logan's intentions not only just saving the world but also making it so that the one power could be used by everyone That's an interesting way to think about the word bind. And Mm, I kind of like that. Because prior, every the first three episodes, they are always saying save or break, save or break. But then he comes in and specifically says bind Mm -hmm. the world. So I think that goes beyond just saving it. Plus, he seems pretty liberal. He wants, I feel like he's down for as many people to have the power and use it as they want. Yeah. Yeah. And that's a huge issue in the world is that men who channel are fucking insane, basically, or destined to go insane. Mm -hmm. And also the kind of hatred that the Reds have towards men who can channel obviously creates its own issues and out in the world so i think that that's i like the way you're thinking about that Mm -hmm. we talked about you know the next scene a little bit on the instant reaction but it's good to see that not only parent is getting these like one-off dreams on the side like everybody Mm -hmm. like all the five are having their own individual visions of like the dark one and seeing crazy shit and like after Rand was whispering a little some sweet nothings into Matt's ear saying, you know, I'm here in case you need anything. He blows out the lantern and then has this crazy fucking dream. This is I will say this is his second one. Most I think we've only seen Perrin have one. I mean, they all shared one off screen, but this is the second time we get Rand 
getting a dark one dream. So he puts puts them ahead of the others in terms of dream count. <laughs> I and I think that's really important for yeah. that conversation that happens later with between uh, Logan, <laughs> Logan, Moraine and Lan. Because they say that Moraine says, I don't even think the Dark One knows who the dragon is. So that means don't overemphasize the dreams. Because if, if Moraine's right, because that means if, if the Dark One doesn't know which one of them is the dragon, he's just going to keep sending these visions. I think he's like selecting, it feels like he'll drive Rand mad and like basically place his bet on Rand being the one. If he like kills himself, does something stupid, whatever, then he'll just go to the next one, kind of corrupt them a little bit more. But he still has that, those seeds in all of them right yeah. now. And to describe the dream a little bit too, just because the parent part of it is wild, because I'm pretty mm. sure that's Layla's body that he is just that's what I was just thinking. hammering that hammer into. It showed the it showed like a wrist and the jewelry, and I think it was the same one yeah. that we saw like of her in the forge in yeah. episode one. I think I she had something. No it was like a, a pinky ring kind of thing too, like, like almost a sheath for her pinky. So he was just getting after it in the worst way possible. And then we kind of see Matt wandering with a really bloodied red hand mm-hmm. which i'm not sure what that means. i kind of at first i thought it was an attempt to at letting Rand think that he was the one responsible for killing the family like i thought that was the premonition that like what where's matt like he might be killing the family right now because his hands are bloodied in that scene and that's why he ran to him in that moment but it became the opposite that it was the the fade that ended up killing him but I, I thought it was tied to that specific mm-hmm. moment, but I could be absolutely wrong. It could be just a foreshadow of an event that hasn't happened yet. Yeah, I have no idea. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know. Which one of those do you think is more likely? Uh, an event that hasn't happened yet. And if, okay. and if the body that Perrin is hammering isn't Layla's, then I think that is also a foreshadowing of an event that is yet to come. Like that Perrin might just eventually become a mer- like a, just a serial killer yeah. of some sort or just driven mad in some way. But that's just, I have no idea. I think that i have an idea of what it means mm-hmm. which one matter parent matt okay. parents was just wild i don't know what the fuck was going <laughs> yeah on that there. was just interesting i think it was oh like- okay i think i might know what's the deal with matt is too but but we'll see maybe we'll talk about it in what do you think paul four years maybe yeah I'll, right. I'll probably guess it real soon i'll throw it in, <laughs> i'll throw it in my calendar for me and you talking about it in four years last thing that happens in the dream is that Egwene gets taken by the dark one himself mm-hmm. and then that's when the ember eyes show up and then he wakes up and then the Emba. whole final part of this which, timeline plot line happens which is incredible love this final scene mm-hmm. of tom matt and Rand just with the dark one just so much perspective going on with with all these characters it's fucking insane if kyle wants to walk us through or luke yeah, I mean, they just walk into the freaking house, and this is, I genuinely thought it was Matt that murdered the family the first time I watched yep. this. Oh, yeah. And I was 100%. freaking out on the inside. I yeah. was like, this show is done. It's yeah. probably done. My I'm like, heart- I'm over. This is fucking the worst thing ever. And then, of course, you get the, Tom even starts freaking out. He's like, well, grab him. We got to get the fuck out of here. Grab him. And then the whole music in the background just goes dead silent, and it focuses on Matt's face. You see some darkness coming out of his mouth, and he lifts the dagger up. And it's just in dead silence. I see you. And then the fucking fade jumps out. And it was just, I thought it was fucking fantastic. The battle ensues. We have this epic fight between Tom and, and the fade where Tom's chucking the knife. The fade's catching it. And you can, one thing that we pointed out after our second or third rewatch was that the fade had the blood. So that's definitely confirmation that the fade was the one that murdered the family. Yeah. And I liked Paul's pickup. Uh, he mentioned this on the instant reaction too that. Whatever that blackness was in Matt's mouth was, to me, was very identical to what was in Shadar Logoth, the curse that covered the whole entire city. Like it did seem like it was like oozing out of his mouth, kind of, and then just crawled back in. So he, whatever is infecting him is still there, one hundred percent. And that, now I'm actually thinking also, like, is his madness related to the curse that it, of him holding the blade, or is it because he's getting more connected to the One Power? That's a question we'll just have to sit back and wait and see. But what do you think? The blade. I think Lan, when he was telling the story about his city, there was just a power that corrupted everybody, made him go evil, and they all just. So it's kind of similar to just the one power. I assume that is what has Matt right now. Is the blade and not the one power? Is what you think? Yeah. Or do you think they're both tied? No, I think it was whatever the evil was that in Shadar Lagoth that Mm -hmm. caused the initial downfall of like everybody in that city. Mm, but it, oh got me thinking now you know <laughs> if shadar logoth was somehow a part of the old battle of the dark one and the dragon reborn and maybe that's the birthplace of the corruption of men's one power usage is like that because it, 
the curse was black and you know it's kind of tied to the weaves the black weaves that uh Loghain had so maybe it was like an old battleground that is the just the birthplace of men's corrupted I'm I just love, theory thinking. Yeah, right now. I, I love this all I out. love what you're saying. I love the way you're thinking. But that city was built after oh, okay, the breaking okay, of the world. Okay. So yeah, because that that city was the city that fought with that was supposed to support Manetherin. Okay, gotcha. Yeah. Damn it, thought I was really something there. I like it though. No, like that was it. great. <laughs> I mean, I just like the connections you're all trying to make. It just it's really fun to listen to. Speaking so of coming. Speaking of connections, Tom, I'm a little wary of him just because. If he does escape a fade, it's like, all right, I didn't see how you escaped. That's a little sketchy. Maybe you were just giving him a status report update. Mm. Are, you, are you a dark friend mm. here? Because how did this bitch find us? But I love Paul keeping us grounded about Tom Maryland because you did it a little bit too on the instant reaction where it's like, <laughs> everybody's well, maybe hyping he, him what, on. Yeah, yeah, what do you <laughs> have against my on. boy? I love him. Yeah, uh, I like check. Uh, I honestly, I appreciate it. A little sketch. But so, I liked, I did like their all that those three's journey this episode. It was really definitely the second best storyline we got this episode behind Logan. And we see as Matt and Rand are uh, riding away on the horse, Matt doesn't have the doll that the little girl gave to him. I thought that was going to be huge going yeah, forward. The Birgitta. Yeah. So that is a really fun little nod to world building and lore from the books. So Birgitta Silverbow is like one of the just like a legendary figure from just kind of like stories so that is just a fun little nod to that's book what readers. the doll was yeah was, that's oh. the name of it was Birgitta, oh, and okay. that's kind of like a little head nod to book readers like yo we got you gotcha. <laughs> cool. we'll move on from the the sausage fest of Rand, tom and matt and i don't even say that as a negative because i would love to join that sausage fest but we'll move on to a little bit of a lady-centric storyline so we get the Aes Sedai Nynaeve and Loghain and we actually learn a lot about the warders too but the first thing we're going to talk about will be they throw a ton of information at us in this storyline so the first kind of topic we're going to try to tackle here is going to be the division slash politics of the Aes Sedai both in the camp and in the tower and then they do tell us a lot about women channeling so this is like my favorite shit ever and I'm super surprised that because this is world building stuff, right? And it's supposed to be the slow burn, bring it, put it at the beginning so it pays off later and you have an understanding of the whole structure of a certain faction or something in fantasy. So I'm surprised that the best episode of the whole series so far also has one of the most seed planning, politics setting um, storylines. And that's what all this uh, Aes Sedai talk goes into. We find out about the Ajas and the different colors. Some of them have basically different personal not personalities but goals depending on what color you are you're in and you have a different amount of warders depending if you're in the green versus not like we get so much good shit here and then we also find out that basically everybody thinks the reds are just kind of stuck up a little bit and they ha- they're sort of the hotheads that are single minded just want to kill all the guys that have the power and stuff like that and you get a little bit more glimpse into that and there's just so much good stuff here is it a spoiler to ask if there's more than just we've only been introduced three colors? Are there more? Yes, there's. Okay. Seven. I, I, I would have yeah, assumed it's not a spoiler. The opening sequence, if you mm-hmm. noticed that, like they weave all of the different colors and they show you a woman dressed in each oh, color. In each color, yeah, because there's then, a yellow. Yeah, and yeah, then at the end, okay. all the colors blend in. It's just a coincidence that it's only been green blue. That's just who we've met so far. Okay. There's a reason why those are kind of the most active like yellow might be like stay at the white tower yeah, knowledge seeker kind of they ones. have yeah, they different have color like but yes <laughs> okay but yeah i just imagine yes. that being one that of is them. one like, of them yeah where reds go out and can do things green obviously are battle so they're going to be traveling a lot but blue is the only one that i guess i can ask now is what specifically because she does she, leandrin kind of goes into blue a little bit but it's more of shit talking rather than what they actually do she's not terribly wrong in her estimation of them. So I think spies is an interesting word. It's never a word I think about when I think wheel of time, mm. but it is correct. The blues are very secretive. They're known to have like a really big informant network around the world. That's what, if you remember episode one, Moraine says there's rumors of Taviran in the two rivers. That's kind of a slight nod to that. The blues purpose is it would be like a little like would little finger be a blue? No, no. Okay. I was thinking, and I don't even know this from the books yet, because they don't even get super clear on the what the different ajas are. You kind of have to infer what some mm. of them are. But for me, I thought the blues seem a little bit more prophecy driven. 
and caring about like the top, the overall big picture parts of the world. But okay. I don't know. Again, I could be wrong and just could be Moraine. Yeah, that's I think that's a good kind of estimation based off of what we know now. So yes. the only blue we know is Moraine and her and Lan for the past 20 years, she says in this episode, have been trying to find the Dragon Reborn. Right. So that's kind of her personal mission statement. She obviously works within the greater organization of the blues. Can we also talk about warders too in this in this section as well? Let's Fuck hit the yeah. greens first though. What do you guys think uh, about them? Because that's going to connect right to the warders. I mean, as of right now, that's definitely where I'm I'm lying is is greens. I feel like I feel like I don't I, I definitely don't identify with red, obviously, because I have a no. penis and I would want to have the <laughs> one power for myself as well. They don't fuck with you either. So yeah, so not there. Uh blue because I just really again still don't have too much an idea of what they do. I just think Gryffindor. Yeah, but like, yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't identify with Gryffindor, so I'm going to go with the green so far. Just like I would love to be on the battlefield as just like a strong Aes Sedai woman, just mm. fucking shit up. That and it great. makes sense that they get so many warders too, because they're the ones on the front lines. Yeah, so you would need some a lot of backup to have on the on the battlefield. Paul, what do you what do you think you identify as? Red, <laughs> yeah. going against your own kinds. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, no, I kind of like the freedom Blue has. Mm. Like Marine just kind of seems to just be going about like has her own agenda, trying to has a mission this mm. can, like, can pretty much do whatever she wants her own convictions and she's sticking to them yeah. yeah and that's interesting you say too with the freedom and her own mission they mentioned here that the amerlin seat is kind of yeah what is that elaborate it's the leader of so, the eyes oh, the, the head yeah. it's like the king basically oh, yeah, 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 the yeah. queen and they mentioned that they mentioned her that she would be upset with kind of leandrin going out and doing things on her own just kind of bypassing any laws and procedures that they have Moraine has been kind of almost doing that for 20 years. And then we also find out a little bit that Karene is the the one green and then Alana is the other green. And the two of them are trying to talk to Moraine, but you get the feeling the way that Moraine interacts with all of them that she's very standoffish. They have like a weird idea of her in their heads. I'm just kind of curious what you guys thought of that, that Moraine is not an outcast, but kind of an outcast. You can kind of get those vibes i mean just the way she treated the the four potential drs like you can kind of see that negative side of her and that why people maybe aren't the most fond of her but at the end of the day i'm I, like i just think she's a great character i at least from as a viewer of the show you know i can understand her intentions are good so of course i'm going to root for her but i can i can understand why the tension would be there yeah they seemed like they didn't completely understand Moraine's goals or objectives mm -hmm. like they yeah she literally said like oh like you're just trying to use our friendship to get some information out of me it's kind of like you keep saying Gryffindor like you're super loyal it's almost as if the other eyes to die are worried about what Moraine or Blue might do in the name of you know the one power yeah or, or I, power. I imagine like they think she is just very selfish like everything she does is for herself but they don't understand that it's also for the greater good I think well, they just have a one small thing that Karene says a little bit earlier in the episode is that she tells Stepin when they have their one-on-one -on -one for a second I respect the fuck out of Moraine yeah. She says something along those There's lines. There's tension there, but she does But she's annoyed at the lack of transparency, which yes. it has to be how Moraine is, especially from like coming from the book side, because if she just started telling you things too early, it would just kind of ruin the whole story. She knows so much and she has so many plans and she has so many networks and prophecies, all this in her head. And if she just started telling people it would be bad book, it would be bad storytelling. But that's kind of how I'm getting the vibes that I don't know if it's just her or if that's the blue in general, but that's what the vibes that I'm getting from Karenny's comments. There's a really funny part of this book and just like the story in general that me and Luke have talked about a little bit as he, as he gets deeper into the series that there's kind of a theme where if you find out a little bit too much, Moraine's like, all right, you're with us. Your life is ours now. Like you're with the squad. You can't leave the squad. You can't tell anyone anything like you're just with us now. You know like, too much. Yeah. You're part of this now. Someone let it slip to you, but it doesn't fucking matter because you can't tell anyone. So now you're in the pattern with us. The, the wheel has put you here for a reason. So you got to ride with us. And they kind of just scoop up people throughout the way like that, which is kind of funny. The last thing I want to talk about politics wise, specifically for the Ajas, are the conversation that Leandrin and Karene have later in the episode when they're both holding Loghain back. And Leandrin's trying to plant her, not plant her seeds because she's not, Okay, so I like to point out that Leandrin did a great job this episode by, again, not falling into predictable decisions where 
we were watching it, Dave, I think for the first time, I thought she was going to try and break Logan out so they can gentle him on purpose. She never actually does that, which is cool. He kind of breaks out from stepping and all that. So she's do she does it. And then when she has the conversation with Nynaeve, she does a good job of showing the perspective of the red saying we cleanse the world of the evil. So she's not pure evil, even though like she is a red, they hated Aja and, you know, people that don't understand the eyes to die, like all think they're evil and stuff. I think Leandrin did a really good job of sticking within the, the red Aja. But then she does have that conversation with Karene about saying how she wants to prematurely gentle Logan because of how strong he is before bringing him to a trial in Tarvalin. Um, but then Karen chirps back saying, you're the red, you're the one that should be telling me we can't do this. So there is that dynamic of her trying to kind of trying to break the red mindset, but at the same time, not in a predictable where you, she's a pure evil kind of way. Right. So I think she, again, Leandrin is great at what she does. I'm sure Leandrin has her reasons for being such a quote unquote bitch in yeah. all of this. Like I'm sure her backstory is very like driven by a person who um, specifically a man who went mad and probably murdered someone close to her uh, is how I'm going to guess that backstory goes. She, uh, she has some reasons. Yeah. She that's has just, some reasons. Exactly. So on paper, of course I looking at her, she's a bitch and she sucks, but like there's obvious, there's gotta be a reason for that. Yeah. And if it wasn't obvious, red Aja members never have warders cause they hate men. So they mm-hmm. never have pairs. All right, what was the next part you wanted to discuss here? Well, Luke just brought up a good point that I would like to just kind of reiterate again. When Karene and Leandrin have that conversation about Leandrin kind of trying to get in there and, and is a little gentle happy, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. And a little earlier, Stepin makes the point that Leandrin's kind of gaining traction a little bit with the camp and that there's been rumors that the Reds have kind of just been willy nilly gentling people across the world. So there's a little bit of doubt that's kind of seeping and not even doubt, but the tension is still coming in a little bit. They obviously have been through a lot. They capture Logan together and they know that they're in this single mission together, but the Aja colors are still kind of at each other's throats. That's what happens bit. in the opening of episode one. Is they're gentling yes. someone, just a random male user of the yeah. power. With no trial. Obviously. No trial. Yeah. yeah. So we can move from the Aes Sedai and the Ajas themselves into the warders. So I know, Dave, you said you wanted to talk about this a little bit. I love, love, loved this part of the episode. They just characterize the the warders so well. I feel like a lot of in the books, they're kind of just in general, they're just kind of warm bodies with names that do things. And I just like here we had the scenes around the fire and they're laughing and they're telling jokes. And I feel like that's kind of how it would be because they do live in the White Tower together when they're there. So they would have these kind of friendships. My second watch through the whole time, I'm just thinking, damn, like, I really wish Rand was at this fire right now listening because he just views like we get him screaming at um, Moraine in episode two about like, what why does the- a man do at the White Tower? Yeah, we become we're just gonna become lap dogs to the eyes to die. Like, fuck that. But like in this exact scene, um, it's Stepan who's like, you know what they used to call the eyes to die servants of all. And you know what? As a warder, to be a part of that and to protect a servant, someone who is identified as like a servant of the world and just protecting the world, like that's just so amazing to be a part of. So, Rand, wish you were there to listen to that because I think you could get some sense from this. So, you should have just went to the fucking White Tower and become a warder. Real life or propaganda? Who knows? If you ask Dana, she says that the Aes Sedai are the evil ones. True. True. I mean, he's pretty drenched in that lifestyle. So, I don't know if he would have. A different way and what and what was the quote too that someone like Nynaeve asked him like and what is like saying like what does that make you and he's like proud you yeah, know it's, it's not anything pride, but, full spot. Yeah, yeah it's totally an honor to it was be a, a great great scene I yeah. thought and it is that the words I said die mean in the old tongue servants of all so that's what the, the little words the words rather mean that and to jump off of the idea of, of the servants of all Karene has a great line when she's talking to Leandra and to go back to that scene again where she says essentially that the Aes Sedai need to hold themselves to this higher standard and to abide by the laws they set for themselves because of the power they have. They have such a responsibility because of how powerful they are. And I just, I really like that part too. I loved the, the opening scene with Lan and Stepan doing their like, sword forms. Yeah. They're going through like the different stances or like movements. And even though they both had, separate Mm -hmm. weapons or different weapons they still had the basic like end goal of each movement was like block like turn like pair like 
attack. Like it was so cool, even though he has axes, he's still, you know, blocking and they're ending their movements in the same exact time. That's like, damn, water training. I want to know more about that because that seems so tight. The dragon dance from Avatar The Last Airbender is what I'm thinking of the whole time. Zuko and Aang just in form, just mastering firebending. For all the Stormlight Archive fans out there, it reminds me of something from Stormlight Archive. That's the first thing that I think of when I, I saw them going through all those forms like that. What are the other weapons and how would they do that? Form like the too, bowman? You know? Yeah, like, like how would the bowman do that form? You know, that would be really cool. Grab the bow, he was swing. sweet yeah. in the battle. We'll jump in ahead, jump in ahead. Yeah, what do we? And another guy had a spear, I think. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that's what the, we give me all the, the forms. Warriors. Let's let's see all the forms going through the show at some point in time. Sweet. And we do actually see too the with the spear and the bowman, they are Alana's warders. I don't have their names on hand, so I apologize, but they I just their characterization too was great. I mean, we get to see how close the two of them are bonded to the same sister who is Alana. I just thought that was a nice little it's it just keeps happening in this show that they obviously made a focus on this diversity and this level of representation, but it doesn't feel like it's token or just thrown in your face. It just feels so natural in the world. Like it's so accepted. Yeah, I might have to switch to be a green because the greens fuck. So <laughs> you were saying that <laughs> I, I, I might have to switch. Speaking of fucking. You like that transition, Paul? Yeah, we can move into Nynaeve and Lan's storyline. So this, I thought, was another central theme that kind of wove throughout all of the uh, the scenes with these characters. They have a really nice back and forth. I like it because Nynaeve is obviously very intense and she just is in your face. And Lan is doesn't really back down from it. He kind of takes a more playful vibe to it because he likes that she's a strong woman. I think that all the interactions that they gave them were just kind of money in the bank. Kind of reminds me of you in Asia a little bit. Oh, yeah, really? <laughs> yeah, Asia's the strong woman in that relationship. <laughs> just pushes Kyle around, yeah. but Kyle likes it. I just so. play with it. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was amazing when he's like, hey, like you're welcome by our fire. You know, as long as you don't shove anybody in it. Yep. Like, her attitude is just so she'll do whatever the fuck she wants. I'm uh, I'm shipping these two. Put it on the board. What's, and you were practicing yeah, the name? The, practicing the name. So it's either Nainan or Lenave. <laughs> I thought you were going to say Nainan and then. No, Lenev. Len, Lenave. <laughs> Lenave. Lenave. Just do the one you can pronounce. Nainan. So Nainan. I'm, I'm shipping Nainan right here, right now. I think they're going to b- 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 bang at some point in time. Why not just show. Nylan? Fuck that. Nainan. He didn't think cooler. of it. So yeah. fuck it. Nainan is <laughs> well, it's also, that's, that's Land's full name. It might not be fair. So yeah, exactly. That's what I was trying to. I wasn't. You know, I was balancing it out. Right you were there. not thinking that. <laughs> well, let's let's talk about two more water specific things here, and this is going to be jumping through the whole rest of these storylines. But two other signs of the connection we get specifically for um, at least Steppen. We saw what happens when your eyes to die that you're bonded with magically dies. It basically is like you dying without actually dying right so it's like you're feeling this extreme pain and loss probably both emotionally and physically and it almost destroyed him it it made him cloudy at the end too where he actually almost fucked everybody up and then we also saw that quick little funny scene where moraine and lan are talking one-on-one after the fire scene and he says oh i shouldn't have drank so much you get emotional when i drink so that's another cool little nod that when one of them is getting drunk, the other one's feeling it. So yeah, that's it, was, funny. it was really funny. I, I enjoyed that. Just to add on to the the water bond that they have, the high to die. When Lan walks in and sees Moraine on the bed and she, no words are spoken, he just looks at her for a little bit, can tell what she's thinking, mm-hmm. and immediately says, you know, he's too old. He's not the Dragon Reborn. I was like, that is so cool. I fucking love that. Mm-hmm. They didn't have any prior conversation. He just walks in Caesar and he's like, all right, why is he thinking like that? Blah, 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 blah. Okay, this is why. Dude, don't think that, Marine. I was like, oh, so cool. I'm thinking about the connection thing now. And if you're, if you're a, let's say we're warders and we have our eyes die and they're getting plowed by someone. Am I getting that uh, orgasm too? And am I getting jealous because that's my eye sty getting railed by someone else? Or, you know, the jealousy feels like a personal decision. Yeah. But, but the sensation would be there. Of sex would be there. Oh my God. That's incredible. <laughs> notes. I'm taking notes. For what? 
Join the Warders. <laughs> free That's orgasms. One note. Free you orgasms. Say, join the Warders. Step one, join the Warders. Step two, question mark. Step three, have sex. <laughs> Jedi mind chick, no hands orgasms. <laughs> I guess, honestly, yeah, I gotta guess so. But Paul, what you just hinted at there, I think is the most important, is one of the best parts of this whole episode with Moraine questioning if Loghain is the true dragon reborn. Like that whole way she portrayed it as an actor was so good from the first scene all the way till the conversation at the end. And I think that's just a good segue for us to go back to the beginning and kind of work our way through all the Loghain stuff. We're yeah. done with that because this shit is just awesome. It's so epic on in, in the most like manga and like fantasy way mm. where... You find out through Moraine's perspective that only three of the eyes that die in the camp are strong enough to be holding. What are they? What's the word that they use? Shielding. They shielding Loghain from using his power. And he's basically in a meditative state where in a cage in the middle of this cave being held by two of the strongest eyes to die probably in the world. I don't really know. But if they're the only three in the camp that can do this, that says something about their power level. And that says even more about Loghain's power level. Because it's just crazy how strong this dude is. They have to focus all their attention to keep him in there from just breaking out. And he's not even breaking a sweat. He's just sitting there waiting for his moment, biding his time. And that's why I bring up the the anime thing. Because it's like A's. And we've said this like every time we watch this episode (laughs) from Bleach. It's just so cool. Him just waiting. And when Moraine starts getting involved and she even says, okay, I'm healed enough. Let me try. She finds out right away how strong this guy is. And then we get a one off line saying, yeah, that's only half his power. That was so like, anime. And line. that's what made Moraine question it, which led to that land conversation later before the end or com- later conversations. But man, it was so cool. She also does say to land later, she experiences half of Logan's power. He's obviously very strong. Quick side note, the sound effects that they've been using throughout these episodes have been great. And that scene, particularly when you hear like the boom, like when she like the power hits her. Yeah, I thought it was really good. And Rosemary Pike does a good little like kind of flinch. Mm-hmm. But Land does ask her about how powerful Loghain is. And she says that she doesn't think that he is as strong as Egwene is. And I remember we were watching. We just watched with our friend Alki. And he said, well, like that Egwene's is that crazy. strong. Paul. Yeah, I mean, that's your girl. It's, Paul did guess that. It's nuts. I don't, I guess because I don't know, she's so young and she's like shows promise or something, but I was not getting that vibes from what we've seen from her. So that statement is just mind blowing. I mean, the potential, I guess, is there. It's weird because I don't know, like, if you are able to use the one power, is, is your power limit set at like if you're able to use it or if you train? Will you be able to use it better? Well, I think efficient. there is an upper limit because of that story about Minetherin and the queen taking in too much and blowing up. Basically, she just I'm sure there's a limit for everybody, but the dragons is probably sky high. Yeah, there's a certain limit for everyone. The limit definitely varies. There's definitely characters that will meet that are very weak in the power. There's characters that will meet that are very strong in the power. I want to say gun to my head right now that it is an innate thing. It's not something that you can really. You can't train to be able to take in more power, but you can train to be more efficient and to like use weaves in better ways. I would say you probably have a low ceiling. I'd probably be way stronger than you. (laughs) Yeah, but I'd have a super high floor. I'd be just very efficient. I'd be the man. I would just create a little niche for myself and they would never be able to like get rid of me because I'm so good at that one thing. They'd be like, oh (laughs) shit, that job. Call Kyle. Oh shit, that job. Call Kyle. <laughs> Next thing you know, I'm living in a fucking mansion. I make my own white tower. You're the you're the white tower uh resident butthole bleacher. That's what you are <laughs> with your power. Oh, dude. The man was stunned. <laughs> <laughs> I have no comeback to that. How do we get here? <laughs> um I don't know. What where, where did we talk from? I just don't even remember. I oh, think we we're, were, we're, about we're finishing up with Egwene. Egwene. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because Egwene's potential is nuts. That was quite the journey. I want to see Egwene go back in contact with an Aes Sedai or somebody that knows how powerful she like is now. With no knowledge of the next episode, I'm guessing that we're going to start having Egwene and Perrin's storyline ramp up. While we're talking a little bit about Loghain's strength leading up to the episode climax, I do really like the one line that Alana says where she says, Loghain is so strong that it has to be a sign that it's the end of the age. And she also infers that the last battle against the Dark One is coming. These type of events 
where we're meeting people that are this strong in her eyes are like, okay, like we're getting to the end game now. I just thought that was an interesting little line that they threw out there. End game in nine more seasons. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> in her eyes, she has no idea what's about yeah, to in come. her eyes. It's coming around the corner for us. We got a little bit of a time before we're going to get there. But so if we're ending with talk of Loghain, I guess this basically leads us into the battle, right? Where Loghain's army finally arrives at the camp. The FDR is what they're there to defend. And <laughs> we get some really cool looks into the, just the, we we say this all the time. We said it in the Insta reaction, but goddamn the choreography of everything between from just the warders, like the bowman, the axe guy, land, the spear guy. We get the, these techniques on different weapons. And we also see the Aes Sedai doing their thing, just slinging weaves everywhere and just causing these huge explosions. We get the quote that, you know, seven Aes Sedai and their warders should be able to just fend off this. What kind of, small... They say, what kind of army could take on seven full tra- fully trained Aes Sedai? Yeah. Yeah. So we there's never really a doubt that things are going to go bad. It does feel that way at some point, but that's just a confirmation that if things did go bad, Something must have like tide of battle must have really happened, but I just really love this scene. But it would have only been because of Loghain's presence. Yeah, exactly. Like the Loghain army Loghain itself been, yeah. proved to be true that statement, which I was surprised. I thought they were gonna that was gonna be a stupid writing piece there where they said, yeah, like seven Aes Sedai should be able to take on a whole army, and then they were gonna kill like three of them. And I was gonna be really upset if they did that because that one red girl actually gets kind of fucked up. She mm-hmm. gets, but like we but see, heal her. we see yeah, a green yeah. one heal her a little exactly. bit. But it's so hard to kill these girls because they're because so fucking strong. And in, in that moment too, it's Nynaeve's perspective. So it's her, like her ears are ringing, like she's so confused that this huge battle is literally happening right now when things were just good last night. She did not know this was gonna happen and. She's looking around. She sees all these people coming in. So from her perspective, things are shitty. But like realistically, if you're watching, like the Aes Sedai really never, besides that one, they're all holding their own. Like there's yeah. never a doubt. Yeah. That I mean, they're the them. battle Aja, right? Like they should be. This is their specialty and they prove it. The effects and CGI was awesome, especially towards the end. I think it was Alana that like has that full on yeah. explosion of yeah, power it where it just keeps reminding you and flashing back to Moraine scene in episode one where you just see the level that they can hit. And it's like, how do you even attack these motherfuckers? I love when I think it is Alana too, who also catches the arrows, the arrows yeah. too. That is so badass and just resends Alana's them back dope. down. Yeah. Yeah. She made a she made it a, a good mark on me this episode. She's a beast. Yeah. yeah. She is kicking ass. She's got two waters that she's banging. She's pretty much living the life. <laughs> she is living life. And she drew inspiration. I think she was like, I wanted to become a green Aja because, you know, there are these like heroes from all these past battles who really inspire me. And that's what I want to become. And she definitely did it in this. Yeah. scene absolutely and but the the startling of the the battle allows Loghain to break free like there's a pause in Leandrin and is it Karene? Karene yes are distracted by the noises coming from the battle and in that moment Loghain just breaks out she also says that her wards were broken so yeah. his, that's like somebody True. in his army I guess was able to like come maybe there was I another man people, no, they I were kind of like people. trip wires Oh, okay, okay. So, yeah. and because what is in what show? I think is it magicians like where wards are actual yes. like yeah, it's different. The the term ward is different in this than it is in the like the okay. magicians where he technically did. If it was the magicians, he had wards on him, preventing him holding from, his magic. Yeah, in there. so gotcha. dude, I loved the scene when he breaks out though because after he sees that opening and he does like the mini almighty push thing where he's like, right? Yeah. Like he pushes everybody out <laughs> and throws some, the, some of the icy dies icy dies against the wall. I see. <laughs> <laughs> I see that. I could not laugh at that. Um, she, he has that fucking awesome outburst of power and he just stands up. His eyes still closed. He starts cracking his neck as the magic's filling into him and he's just burning the cage away from him. It's just so, I always use this word, but it's just because it's fantasy. It's so epic. Just that look in his eyes where he's just, he has the, the corruption magic flowing around him and he's just getting back into his, his rhythm and he, it's amazing. The fact that he also probably, he 100% knows that there's seven Aes Sedai. So even when he breaks out, the confidence that he has knowing that even now that he's free and that even if he's surrounded by seven Aes Sedai, it's like he probably could fuck them all up. Seven Aes Sedai. Dicey, dicey, <laughs> dicey, yeah. Well, he was wrong, though. He was. Yeah, too he was totally wrong. It. But he also did get thrown off by what Nynaeve does. I don't know if we want to get there just well, yet. On, but yeah, yeah but Marine he, gets, he has a little there's a little surprise that pauses him and then they can capitalize on that moment, which 
Moraine walking in since Leandrin and Karene. Karene are knocked out. Uh, she walks in and you can see her shadow. So this in the instant reaction. Tell from the shadow that it was Moraine because mm-hmm. of the shoulder pads. <laughs> her shoulder pads are infamous. I she love had that. an iconic look. This is such a great conversation. This, this conversation would have uh, was Leandrin like physically awake in this moment, or was she still? They, were, think, they wake up by the end. I was, gonna, I was gonna say if Leandrin saw this conversation happen, I think she would have lost her shit because Moraine is doing her blue Aja thing, and she's like, "Look, I'm not here to fight just yet. I want you to answer some questions." Where Leandrin would have been, "Fuck the questions and answers. Let's just gentle this dude right here and now." So this would have pissed her off. But this, you kind of see the blue side of her come out in this scene where she's like, answer my questions. Why do you think you're the dragon reborn? And mm-hmm. he gives good answers. Like Kyle referred to at the beginning, he says, I hear the the echoes of all the past dragon reborns in my ears, referring to the, the black whispers that we heard in the beginning of the episode. And at first you think you are led to believe, to me, you're led to believe that he genuinely believes that they were the dragon reborns. But when you hear it from... Uh, Moraine's perspective definitely after the second time I'm like okay she's making sense where she's just like it's just the madness you're not actually hearing the dragon reborns this is just the madness getting to you and just corrupting you yeah that is what tips her off I think yeah because before she was overwhelmed at how his power level is which is still crazy but then she goes on to say even though your power level is out of this world it's trickle compared to what the real dragon reborn is going to be. Yeah. And the one other thing that ticks her off too, or like makes her realize that he's not the one is that he says, this is what the wheel wants. And she's like, no, that's that made you wrong. Just you saying that makes you wrong because the wheel doesn't want anything. It's people who want things. So you want it's, she basically called him out. Like you just want to be the dragon. Yeah. reborn. It's not the wheel made you the dragon reborn. It's you wanted to be it. And you yeah. led yourself to think that. And the madness only emphasized that. So just a great spot on job for uh, Moraine to just call him out on that. Yeah, it does feel like a little bit that he is getting himself into the self-fulfilling prophecy where he can channel. And it makes so he sense. thinks, OK, wow, I can channel. And then he starts hearing voices and it's like, whoa, are these my past lives? And then it's like, oh, they could be the dragon. Oh, I could be the dragon. And it kind of he is almost convincing himself of this. But I do like Logan a lot. I think that he's not a bad guy, like we said earlier. And like Luke has said multiple times as well, his character is going to be expanded from the books. So I'm really curious what kind of shit we get from him going forward. They mentioned in the beginning scene, like a little bit of his backstory with your sister and your parents. So I just wonder if we're going to get some of that. I would be totally cool if I was given the ability to make someone the dragon reborn and making it Logan. Like, would that not work out for everybody? That'd be fun. Nah, he's too weak. (laughs) But if he was really the dragon reborn, then he wouldn't be. Yeah, but he's, he's got the right, he's got the right mindset is what I'm saying. I, yeah, that, okay. that's what you want your dragon reborn to be like. It's yes. just being yeah. the real. He was very reborn. honest. He was an honest guy, and absolutely, that's what yeah. you want. But then this leads Marine after she figures out that he's she doesn't think he's the dragon reborn, and she sees the two other Aes Sedai in the cave waking up and coming to. They start to grab him and they start to put him in their own weaves, and and it's they're having this back and forth, and they actually almost get him back into the cage. So, they do. I mean, they. Pretty yeah. much shield him. I really like the way they, get they very close. Yeah. yeah, I like the way they visualize it in the show. Kind of this net that's mm-hmm. going over him and covering him. And I, I, I like it so much because in the books they mention when you are shielded, you're like kind of probing around, like looking for a weak spot. He's in the shield, like with his weaves, trying to poke around. Yeah. I just thought that that was a really, really nice way to show that. But this is where. What hap- Like, how does so, how does Karene end up? They're holding him back. The three of them are holding him back, mm-hmm. and she realizes being Nenev. Oh no! One of, he does find the weak spot. He does end up yeah, finding yes. the weak spot. Yes, he, he fires three projectiles, and she blocks two of them for Karene saves Karene, the other two. Karene. Karene saves Leandrin and Moraine from her two, but then she eats the one and gets pinned to the rocks. Which triggers Stepin to feel that on the yes. battlefield when we're flashing yeah, back and forth. Yeah, that's when you said uh, earlier that he starts to, like, he kills someone still, but, like, even after he kills that person, he's just like a zombie. He's yeah. like, he has no feelings whatsoever. He has that cue that they've been using a lot where the sound kind of turns into, like, a little bit of a light ringing. That's yeah. all they're hearing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I kind of like the way they've been using that, I guess, what is that audio cue Mm -hmm. to kind of display information Mm -hmm. and then that is when in the battle alana's like i got this go to the cave yeah and then 
Moraine and Leandrin, who is now furious that this man just killed one of her sisters. They both, they are trapping him again. They are cornering him again. And then as more of the Aes Sedai kind of pour in, they are all helping. And he has the net, the nets going around him again. Oh yeah. And then Stepan, who had, who knew immediately that something was wrong with Karene, he walks in and he fucks everything up. Yes, he does. <laughs> also, King of Gildan dies oh, yeah. at the same we time. See King True. of Gildan is also dead, which in the battle uh, doesn't yeah. really matter, but yeah. it is important to know just in case. What, what happens, happens when you, you uh, never know. That's what happens when you hit your wagon to the wrong horse. Yeah. Yeah. That's going to happen a lot. But this was so fucking crazy. Of course, you had to have that scene where someone's going to fuck up somewhere. Dude, but what a visual, man. Because Stepan was strong enough to break through the weave with his axes, though, it gave it gave Loghain the ability to corrupt the axes and then just turn them all black. And that yeah. CGI looked really, really cool before it just... The tips of the axes that were within the shield. Yeah. Like, you know, he could corrupt that and, you know, use that whole... It was a cool idea. But like what Kyle said on the Instagram mm-hmm. action... Felt weird seeing land on the ground just like bleeding out like that. Yeah. I, I just this scene, there's still such a a small, I guess smaller part of me that there's some things that rub me the wrong way. I just don't really get how Stepan's axes can pierce something in that way that's not physically there. You know, like I don't know if that would happen like that. Like I mean, you, would, just, you wouldn't have seen the shields. You just saw Logan's like on his knees. Yeah, that's true through. too. That, that is was. very yeah. Stepin can't see it going over him, so he just sees him on his knees and is like, "I'm gonna get after it." Like they're just holding him there. I'll just kill him. That actually, yeah. I actually buy that. Yeah, th- I buy that. I buy his reaction a hundred percent. He is. It's a kind of it's canon thing that when your eyes that I dies, there's kind of something that breaks inside of you. He would make these type of rash decisions. Yeah, I would. It's I don't. I don't blame visual. him at all for wanting to kill. Yeah. Yeah, yes, you're you right. Are. You convinced me it's that just I'm a, not, I don't love that now. It's just a lot of they did make a lot of this stuff up and they nailed so much of it. It's just being someone who has read the books. This is it's kind of at this point, it's the double edged coin of it's a blessing and a curse. This is kind of the curse part of it where I just don't really know how that would ever happen based on but what you're saying. I he know. would have been more devastated. And no. no, he's saying that the axes physically shouldn't have been able to go through the magic because that's not like a system that's set up for. You can't like break through magic like that with, with, a, a with steel. Axle. Yeah, it's yeah. magic. Yeah, if anything, magic. like that would stop it from getting. Mm. Like he couldn't. He what? He couldn't really be penetrating anything that then Logan could access. Mm. Luckily, the implications of that are probably super small, and like that yeah. probably doesn't. That scenario doesn't happen enough oh, where yeah. it's going to affect anything majorly. But I agree. Now that this, I've until this moment, I didn't really think about it like that. But you're right. But, yeah. But I just there's so much to love that I would never let something like that ever get in the way of me enjoying the show. I kind of wish that Lan like would have deflected yes. the blade that was coming at him. You go know, because he did deflect like so much shit earlier. But I don't know. That could have been you know the explosion of power from Logan. But in comes our girl Nynaeve. And um, I think she might be the dragon born. This is it. Yeah, I think this to, might be it. She decides to go super saiyan and just. Yeah, she yeah. just starts screaming like, no, no, no. And then heals everybody close to her. I really thought everyone in that moment was about to die. But then once you see that naive is the only one looking around and is like the only one of use in that moment. I'm like, okay, she's going to save her. But in that brief moment when Lance pouring blood out and before you see naive get up, I'm just like. Everyone's fucking dead here. Like, Loghain just won, just beat everybody, and we don't have a story anymore. No, it'll be our main character. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Moraine cannot stop getting stabbed. That is also something that I'm not in love with. That <laughs> she just keeps getting fucked up. Yeah. It's crazy. I mean, it like Luke had said in the instant reaction, this really does get us point A to point B. It serves a really big narrative purpose, and the idea behind it, I'm perfectly okay with. I just really wish that an event like this would have happened maybe a little later in the season. It, yeah. You know, I can understand that. Dude, yeah. This episode, the beginning of it, she's like, oh, I just healed up from episode one. Like, yeah. Let me help out a little bit. And by the end, she's already got you know, another p- shaft sticking out of her abdomen. But to be fair, she does get healed immediately. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> Nani puts that work in real quick. <laughs> and not only healed, they get their stamina and strength back because then instantly all of the eyes die in the room stand up. And then that's when they do the gentle, the gentling process mm-hmm. and pull. And that was a really cool visual too. When they strip 
Loghain of his powers, yeah. and you see all of the black corruption just pouring just out of out. him. It was like yeah. black wings almost. Yeah. It looked and like. then it was the just the beautiful scene of him sitting there on the ground, like just absolutely devastated. He can't touch the power, and he's probably going through some of the similar things that Tom's nephew Owen did. He had tears like dropping yeah. from his eyes as he was being gentle. Yep. And it was a really cool visual of all the eyes that I'd linking up with the entrance. God, I just love looking. And yeah, exactly. That was her doing what the Reds are supposed to do, right? Like, because that wasn't like an, uh, that was a very valid reason to gentle someone because he was about to fuck everybody up. And Technically, like, we already did. Yeah, so. exactly. And she's leading the charge. She's dropping the fucking, what, you know, like, uh, Logan, whatever his last yeah, name Logan is, Ablar. Yeah, yeah. Ablar. like I, you know, I'm stripping you of your power. All that was awesome to me because it made Leandra, and even though she's a bitch, like she was doing the thing that she's supposed to do, and it was like everyone, even Moraine, was backing her up. Speaking of Moraine backing her up, I'm just very curious of what she was thinking when this was happening, and even the Greens as well. They're obviously upset that Karene is dead, but when they linked with Leandra, and I. I just am curious. I don't think we're ever going to get an answer to it, but did they just assume that they were contributing to gentling someone? I, just, I think so. I just don't. Yeah, I don't know. I will say as well that them linking like that and then gentling him somewhat begs the question of why they couldn't all link and shield him so they didn't need to struggle like that. It's just something that popped up in my head a little bit. Well, I, I guess they knew. They also had mentioned earlier on that they knew Loghain's army was coming or was yeah. nearby. So then if you want to focus all of the ice die on him, then that just leaves everyone else yeah. open. To Keep fight. some of the other ones fresh. Yeah. yeah. So that's just my thought on it. No, I, and I think that's reasonable as well. It was just an idea that popped up that. But I really love Loghain crying because I think that only emphasizes his honest and good intention side of him in the fact that like, I think he was genuinely upset that he lost his powers because he wouldn't be able to quote unquote bind the world anymore. Like in that moment, he knew right away that what he wanted to do was going to be lost. And I yeah. think that was, wasn't him crying that like, Oh, he's nothing anymore. It's just that he won't be able to help anyone. Yeah. Anymore. His next scene, his next speaking scene is going to be super interesting, but we should say the, the quote that when he does see naive, he says like a radiant sun, like it's almost like a direct quote from like a prophecy, literally like a dragon reborn prophecy. And that's probably what led me and Paul to both agree on this, that, we both think that naive at this point in time. Okay, so I was just going to say, we're going to put it on the board because at the end of every episode, we're going to get a pulse take of who you guys think the Dragon Reborn is and you're both now naive. I think it's naive because the episode title is The Dragon Reborn. Naive has the the moment of the episode named Dragon Reborn, so I just can't not think it's her. The sun, vitamin <laughs> <Yeah>. D, DR, <laughs> yeah. Reborn, Nynaeve. Boo. Pretty much confirmed at this point. I uh, no, I'm definitely gonna wait. What do we say about the word confirmed? Can't use that word. Confirmed, you were gonna say that she's confirmed the dragon reborn. <laughs> no, no, that's I a wild confirmed. take. <laughs> not not at all. Like at this point, I'm like, all right, is a dragon reborn is like definitely it's only one person because I'm like, dude, it could be like two or three of them combined. Yeah, who says that it couldn't be all four of them? Who says that it can't be four dragons? The reborns? woman with the eyes, yeah, so white she couldn't see, but yet she saw. <laughs> Yeah, well, she couldn't see, so maybe she didn't see exactly what. Without a doubt, a ten out of ten episode. Like, yeah, I thought it was it it, it was nine out of ten for me. If Egwene and Perrin had, you know, a little bit more of Sex. an episode. <laughs> no, no, that would have no. ruined it. No, that would have ruined it. They had a little bit more of an exciting storyline. Maybe it would have been a ten out of ten. But to comment I on really that, it. I think that we will look back on this episode and you will then rate it a 10 out of 10 because there might not have been a lot of action or very super entertaining stuff that happens in that storyline but the words that they say lay such a foundation for i would say Perrin for the entire series and Egwene and aram as well it's just there's a lot of things that get said that we'll come back to and be like, like things will happen. And we'll be like, Oh my God, remember season one, episode four, they said this. Yeah. Oh my God. Remember season one, episode four, they said this. And it's going to be like that. It could definitely could. Have it will. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. It will. Oh, confirmed. Yeah. Confirmed. confirmed. Yeah, take I can say confirmed. Uh, one thing before we get to our bank, Mary, and we, we peace out for this episode. Did the name, if you weren't watching with, closed caption and the opening scene with Loghain and the king of Galdean. Gal I can't even pronounce Galden. it. Galden. This is Galden. G-H-E-L-D-O-N. 
I this one's tough. Then. Yeah, this one is tough because Perrin says it in episode one. And he says Gaelden. Okay. Oh really? I didn't even know they referenced it at all. Yeah, I just thought they were. Just yeah, like, no, they say just... that there was a war. Oh in yeah, 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 you're right. Okay, okay. Okay, so in Gaelden, right when the madness starts talking to Loghain, it has the name of the the madness, and it says Alusha. Yes, which is to me means what? What does that mean? So, to any of you guys, uh, I do enjoy myself a little bit of youtube wheel of time content that i get to enjoy i guess because i've read the series there's yeah. a lot of full spoiler content out there and a channel called what up so w-o-t up follow and subscribe to that channel he mentioned that he actually went back into the books mm -hmm. and the wikis and everything and looked and that was just not a name from the series so it does seem like that's them again developing low gain storyline more okay. than what it was in the books before we get to the B BKM, one thing I just want to say, I said this in the instant reaction, I just want to reiterate it now, is that I personally don't think Loghain is totally out of it right now as a, as a character. I think that the man has such a strong will. He has the will of D, I would say. If his name was in one piece, it would be Loghain D. Ablar. Okay. Do you think he would have Conqueror's Hockey or he would be Will of D? Just the Will of D. But I mean, every Will of D character we met has Conqueror Hockey, so... That's not true. That's actually, yeah, you're right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> anyway, I introduced but... you to Jaguar D. Yeah. Saul. Yeah, yeah, that was the exactly first one. I that was the first of. one I thought of too. But um, no, I just want to say that. Not that I, I know we've. I just said that Nynaeve is, you know, the fifth Dragon Reborn candidate, and I think she's the lead candidate. But I still think that there's something about Logan that is going to keep him as a player in this game. Maybe not as a still a potential DR character, but I just think that his will is so strong and that he really has these good intentions and that he's not going to be like Owen. Oh, and kind of off himself after I think he's this is only going to be a driver for him to become a better person and maybe become stronger from this in some way. Now that we've got that out of the way, let's just get into our everybody's favorite segment here. BKM Bank Hill Mary. We're going to list out three characters. Each one of us is going to go through and name which one we bang, marry and kill. They are going to have real world, real wheel of time consequences. So if we kill the character in this BKM, then they're gone in the Wheel of Time series. So. That is crippling for me. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you got to do it with the knowledge of the show that we have right now. Okay, but with yeah. the show knowledge. So we said Moraine, Egwene, and Nynaeve. And I could start because that's my order right there. I'm going to marry Moraine. I'm going to bang okay. Egwene, and I'm going to kill Nynaeve. Nynaeve dies because she is going to be a lot to handle. I am nothing like Len at all. So if that's the kind of guy she's looking for, it ain't me. That's what Kyle's looking for. <laughs> I'm killing Nynaeve. <laughs> I'm going to marry Moraine because I think she's just a beautiful older woman. And if I'm in this world, like I want her protection. I'm sticking by her. I feel like I'm going to be a main character from by her side. And then I'm going to bang Egwene because I think she's probably the prettiest. Also going off that, Moraine can never lie to you. That's also wow. true. So she's not gonna she never well, lie. She can, she can, she can talk you, around. Yeah, she can talk around, but she can at, on paper never lie. Yeah. Either way. So I'm gonna get to so so if I'm married to Moraine, I also get to bang land too, right? That's a double win. Because he's yeah, my order. So, well, yeah. He gets to feel you banging her, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so there's that. And if that gets yeah. your rocks off, good for you. All right, so <laughs> that's it. Marry Moraine, bang Egwene, kill Nine. Who's up next? I'm gonna kill Moraine. Wow. Because how she's old. I dare you to she's no, old. She's a no, no. She's I think, a witch. I think the real world implications, I think she already did her job of gathering everybody up. I think Egwene and Anive got some some big potential here. So uh I'm going to bang Nynaeve because like what Luke said, it'd be hard to be married to her every day. Her just yelling at me. Yep. And then I'm going to Mary Gwen because she's got the biggest potential, so I should be safe. She's got the biggest potential. <laughs> no, she does not. <laughs> but she'll keep me safe. Okay. This is so hard. I am going to fuck show knowledge. I can hop yeah, in here. I think I have mine. If you yeah, want me can to you go? Them. Yeah. So I'm gonna marry uh, Moraine as well for the reasons we've all said. I'm going to bang Nynaeve and then kill Egwene. And the reasoning behind that is because we said we had real, these had real world intentions in real time. And I just said Nynaeve was the dragon reborn. I'm not going to be responsible for killing the dragon reborn. So I think Egwene is going to be a nobody in this, not like a nobody, but like less of a nobody than the other two. 
And so I'm going to kill Egwene and bang Nynaeve. Okay, so I'm actually going to agree with Paul's assessment with Moraine. In terms of where we're at in the show, she keeps getting hurt. Mm -hmm. She's kind of pulling us all down with being the healer. (laughs) I just don't get it. She kind of got everyone out of the village, so she did her part. So I'm going to kill Moraine. I'm going to marry Egwene only because I love her nose. That's such a weird thing, but I just think she is so cute. So she'll be my wife. And then I'll bang Nynaeve because who doesn't want to bang the Dragon Reborn? There you go. That was a good one. I like that one. We have some finally some difference from the yeah, dark one, the fade, and the <laughs> trollic. We have real people now. We're not just banging trollic. Tune now. in next week for the three main guys. Yeah, we're yeah, going true. for the guys next week. So that's all she wrote. We are Binge Town TV. We'll be covering every episode of Wheel of Time. We'll be doing instant reactions that will come out on the weekend, Friday or Saturday. We'll be doing deep dives. They'll come out sometime during the week. We have day jobs, so things aren't always <laughs> perfectly scheduled. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Binge Town TV. Check us out on YouTube. Subscribe to us on YouTube. We're actually we've been posting more videos lately. All of our instant reactions will actually be videos of us talking via Zoom. So if you want to find out what these four handsome gentlemen look like, definitely check us out there. We have a Patreon as well. Just Bingetown TV. I believe it's patreon.com slash Bingetown TV. We have a website. Spoiler alert. BingetownTV.com. We cover a bunch of TV shows. We're working on Dexter, Winona Earp. We've done the OA. We've done just a lot of shows. The 100, The Magicians, Sci-Fi Fantasy. That's kind of our jam. We are in the future. We'll definitely be covering The Witcher coming soon. We have some Pitchtown TVs coming up. So stick with us. You'll find something you like. You're listening to the Geekscape Network.